guess I can't go into settings, can I? Is mine not? Why is it not? All right, now that makes me angry. Should be as long as 10. Okay, no, it's not the wrong thing.
Dunstan? No. Hmm. Eppheimer? Darn it. Sorry. No. I think Ms. Eppheimer. Uh, no. I know they had that. Oh, who will you know? Dunstan. Gartner Kratz. Ms. Gartner. Kratz. Okay, yeah, I had to choose. Right, there we go. Uh, okay, so let's Oh, Miss Dunstan. Right, okay. Yes. Decker Marino. Oh, Ms. Cortisol. Okay. Okay. Althaus. Aniagua. So, is that behind us? Not Ms. Oh, Ms. Morgan. Sorry. Morgan. Thank mm -hmm. 
<laughs> There's Ms. Leonard. Okay, so I guess Ms. Eppeheimer is not here. Eppeheimer, going, going. Twice, three times, no? Okay. Everyone else is here. I'm here, so. Now we'll see what happens. Ms. Eppelheimer. Yep. There we go. All right. Da, 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 da. There we go. Okay. So continuing on with Islam, I'm talking about the Sunnah, the custom, the Sunnat, the custom or way of life of the Prophet, which determines a Muslim's way of life, a way of living. Here we go. I said that. And I'll get to that in a moment. So I didn't get to that. Actually, I wanted to come back to that. It's out of order. As I said, you have hadiths, which are the narratives or the stories, and you also have a chain of transmission. You want to see where the story came from and the authority of the person who has given the story kind of determines whether it's important enough to follow or take notice of. So when you have a Hadith, and I'm going to show you some examples in a moment, it consists of the text itself, the story from Muhammad or from one of his companions, but mostly from Muhammad, the source of the story, and then the authority of its transmission. And only those who, and this, well, I've mentioned this, I'll mention it again, the, uh, this, uh, chain of transmission of who's giving the story, who's relating or narrating the story, and the level of authority of that person is called the isnad, isnad. And only hadith, and you know there is a plural in Arabic, but I'll just use the singular for, for simplicity's sake. Um, the hadith, only those hadith whose isnad can be traced back to an early and reliable source, as you might imagine, sounds logical to me, would be considered strongly authentic, which would mean binding on a Muslim and how he or she would practice Islam. Otherwise, the, uh, hadith, the hadith are categorized in descending order of their authoritativeness. So you have authority, they're usually, I guess they're organized as more, the most authoritative coming from the most authoritative sources, they're direct, and then lesser ones, maybe that are maybe secondhand or third hand, or maybe not coming from people who are considered as good transmitters of the tradition. A good proportion or portion of the Hadith come from Aisha, who I've mentioned before, who is one of 
Muhammad's wives. In fact, she's considered his favorite wife after, of course, Khadija, his first wife. Remember, Khadija was his first wife. So after Khadija, Aisha is his favorite wife. So if a hadith comes from Aisha, then it's usually of high authority. And an elaborate science has developed, as you can imagine, against or around, an elaborate science has developed around categorizing the hadith and discussing and debating which hadith are truly binding, whether the authorities are good enough and stuff like that. So you have a whole science of hadith studies within Islam to, uh, to make things, uh, to decide which hadith need to be followed and which are not. Examples of hadith are from, well, first I have, a, maybe I should mention the Sahih al-Bukhari before I get into the actual hadith, just so it's clear. Um, there are considered to be six sources of hadith, six collections, six, uh, six recognized collections of hadith. They are called the six reliable works, the six reliable works, which is what this word sahih means in Arabic. It has the, the sense of something that's reliable, okay? So sahih, but there are six of them and they're all considered reliable works. There's six reliable works. Of these, the most reliable are the two that I have here on the PowerPoint. The first would be the collection by this man Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Bukhari, some oftentimes just simply called Bukhari or al-Bukhari for short. And so you can see I have uh, three crescent moons next to the title of his collection, the Sahih al-Bukhari, the reliable collection of al-Bukhari. And coming up second is this collection by a man named Muslim ibn al-Hajjaj, you can see the dates when they died. Bukhari died in 870 AD and Hajjaj in 874, 875. So Bukhari is considered the more reliable and the better collection um, because first, first of all, it was first. It's recognized as the first comprehensive collection of Hadith from the prophet and his companions. And, and it's also believed to contain the more authentic versions of the hadith at the time of bukhari there were according to some of the things i read estimated to be tens of thousands of stories about muhammad and his companions and it was recognized by bukhari but other people that not all of them could be authentic you know some of them were just stories um made up okay um and so that was an issue because if you wanted to know the living, you know, how the, the, the prophet himself, Muhammad, lived the Quran, the Quranic revelation, he wanted authentic, true stories, okay, historical stories. And so Bukhari went to work of going through the stories and, and culling out um, based on Isnad, this idea of Isnad, um, who is it, who's telling the story, is that person really author authoritative, or is that per does that person make mistakes? forget is the person forgetful or does the person expand on the story and add his or her own stuff you know all sorts of questions like that but then you know how is the story been how has it been transmitted is it an authoritative source but it's first hand third hand if someone's saying well i heard that aisha said now aisha would be an important authority for the example of muhammad but if it's just me telling you what i heard aisha said about muhammad or she heard muhammad say something now we're farther removed. So Bukhari did this. And out of these tens of thousands of stories, he was able to bring them down to um, several thousand, still a lot, but not as many. And they, it was a collection that he was comfortable was accurate. And that it stood the test of time. This person, Muslim Ibn al-Hajjaj, did basically the same thing, but he comes later. And so his collection comes second. Okay, it's the second reliable collection of the Hadith of the Prophet and his companions. And there are four others I'm not going to, to mention, but you can kind of see the level of authority. Bukhari is first, then Muslim, and then as you're going down, you have to start being down the list to the other four. You have to start being careful. It doesn't mean they're wrong, but they're, they're of lesser authority than, say, something that's found in Bukhari. Okay, and there are just some pictures of these multi-volume works. You can find them for free on the internet as well. 
And that's where I got some of my examples just to show you. Notice uh, that it's kind of like, if we think about it, if we make a connection here with Judaism, yes, yes, and the Talmud. Yes, there are two versions of the Talmud written around the same time. I think Yerushalmi was a little bit earlier, but nevertheless, um, and Babli is the Babylonian Talmud is given more authority amongst Jews, even though you have the Yerushalmi, the Jerusalem or Palestinian Talmud that's also out there. So a similar thing happens with Islam. You know, you have Bukhari at the top, but then you have other sources that you would certainly look at if you were a legal scholar in, in Islam. So this is from Al, these, these are from Al Bukhari, from volume one, this one from volume four. The first hadith, Abu Huraira, who is, who is a, a major source? He's a high source, he's a reliable source. Abu Huraira, Allah be pleased with him, told. I don't know if told, if, the, if that makes any difference rather than narrated, but anyways, the word is different, so I mark it. The messenger of Allah, Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, said this. A man saw a dog eating mud as a result of thirst. So the man took a shoe, he filled it with water, and kept on putting shoe, water into the shoe and used the shoe filled with water to um, basically uh, sate the thirst, quench the thirst of the dog. The upshot of this was Allah approved of this. So Allah approved of his deed towards the dog and made him enter paradise. I'm assuming it means the man <laughs> and not the dog. Although I wouldn't be surprised if dogs are in heaven. Cats are certainly in hell. Um, but <laughs> Cause I have two of them. I know too much about cats. No, 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 I'm sure cat, I hope cats are in heaven too. But anyways, but a lot, the upshot is that this good, de I mean, a good deed even to a, uh, a non-human creature, this dog, and you have to understand the cu cultural context, dogs are considered unclean animals, they're considered dirty animals um, in, in the Arabian context. So there's a, a subtext here within the context that he, he gave water to this unclean, filthy animal, um, and that, that act was pleasing to Allah. So it's it's telling me the kind of example that I should have, that I should be kind and help out any any creature that is in need, I would think. That might, I think that's the interpretation. That's one I would go with. I'm not an Islamic scholar, but just reading it myself as an outsider. Hadith number 222, and these numbers are all relative. You'll find different numbers for these hadith depending on which edition in English of Bukhari there is. But the version I had called this hadith number 222 in volume one. Aisha, okay, pay attention. She's a major source. Allah be pleased with her, the mother of faithful believers. So that's a title for her in Islam, Aisha. That shows you the level of honor that she's given. She's the mother of the faithful. Narrated, told the story. A child was brought to Allah's apostle. Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. Stop. <laughs> this is, a, you know, you have to be careful with translations because of the word apostle, as we know, is a Christian word. Yes, Christian word, an apostle, someone who is sent out, the 12 apostles, for example. Um, so the person who is translating this is using Western terminology that does not really work in the Arabic. It's more, it should say in the translation, a messenger, not apostle. But because apostles are sent out with a message, they're like ambassadors, sometimes in older translations, in order to make it comprehensible to Western minds, Christians, i.e. Christians, they'll use the word apostle, which is wrong, but it should be messenger. So brought to... A child was brought to Allah's messenger. Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. And the child peed on him, urinated on his garment. Ah! <laughs> what to do? The prophet asked for water and poured it over the soil place. So, you know, I, I kind of look at this like the principle of babies are babies. <laughs> you know, whenever you're dealing with a baby, and all bets are off. You know, babies don't have any control. When they have to pee or poop, they go. You know, it's just this, this life. That's the way babies are. Um, and so, 
prophet shows you what kind of man he is. He didn't freak out. He didn't go crazy. Like, how dare you give me your child that pees on me? Or how dare this baby pee on me? He pours water, he cleans the spot and moves on. So it gives you a sense of his personality and how I, I as a Muslim, if I were a Muslim, should treat things like that. Maybe insults, maybe how people treat me if someone pees on me, metaphorically speaking. Um, or actually pees on me. <laughs> Just clean the spot and say, it's okay, dude, I understand. <laughs> Another hadith, Ibn Omar, and I don't know, I don't know the quality of Ibn, Ibn Omar's memory or transmission, so I can't say anything about that. But Ibn Omar, Allah be pleased with both. Ooh, that's interesting. So does that indicate to us that there's another person involved in this transmission, which might kind of muddy the waters a bit and lessen its authority? I don't know. It's a thought, because it only mentions one person, the son of Omar, Ibn Omar. So Ibn Omar narrated the prophet, Allah's blessing and peace be upon him, said, cut the mustaches short and keep the beards. Well, okay, fine. Which I kind of do, you know, my, my beard gets longish. It doesn't get too long. I try to keep it trimmed, but I usually I almost make a point of trimming my mustache just because I don't have a good mustache. The hair is thick and pokes into my skin. But uh, so here, you know, Muhammad seems to be indicating that beard, you know, you can have a mustache if it's short, but that's not essential, whereas apparently beards are. Make sure you wear a beard. I'm not sure how, how binding that is, though. And just to give you another example from Muslim, from another source, our second source, to show you the difference in how Bukhari treats the Hadith and how Muslim does, Abu Huraira again reported that the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, seven are the people whom Allah will give protection with his shade on the day, day meaning the day of judgment, the, either the end of a person's life or I might mean the end of time. A just ruler, a youth, a young person who grew up with the worship of Allah, a person whose heart is attached to the mosques, which I mean, I think means like visiting the mosque to pray. Two persons who love each other, but depart for the sake of Allah. And I, that's interesting. It might be two, I think that it means like two people who love each other, but uh, they would rather, instead of giving their whole selves to each other, they love God more. And so they separate in order, even though they love each other, they don't come together, I guess, as man and wife, I'm not sure, but they would separate in order to give themselves totally to the service of Allah. And you see that in a lot of religions, in Christianity, you know, you have, you even have stories of married couples who didn't, were not unmarried and in divorce, but they made the choice where, where the husband went into a monastery or, and the wife went into a convent. Um, and they didn't have any more conjugal married relations, even though they were still married and could have, but they wanted to serve God more. Uh, usually find those stories in the Middle Ages, not so much today. Um, or in Hinduism, where as life progresses, as life progresses near the end of life, a Hindu man, especially of the upper castes, the twice born castes that we talked about, um, are supposed to separate from their wives and go off to a, a secluded place in the forest where they study the Vedas all the time and meditate and say mantras. So, so you have this idea in other religions. A man who's being seduced by a beautiful woman, but rejects her, saying, I fear Allah. I will not do it because I don't want to go to hell. I fear God. A person who gives charity and conceals what his right hand does from the left. Which I thought was interesting because that's what Jesus says in, in the Gospels. He says, do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing when you give charity to people, alms, to poor people. Um, I don't know if that's what's in Muhammad's mind, if he knew that statement of Jesus, or if it was just a common, like a proverb, a proverbial statement from the culture of the area. Don't know, but I thought it was interesting. And finally, a person who remembers Allah in privacy and cries. So he cries out of love because the person has so much love that the person weeps tears. So these are seven things that God, that Allah um, appreciates from his followers and will reward on the day of judgment. 
Uh, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm going to move on now to the belief system, the beliefs of Islam. Get that out of the way. Actually, I don't want to do that. Well, it doesn't matter. I did it, so I'll come back. And I'm going to move on, as I said, to the belief system of Islam. Okay. Remember, Hinduism is more culture than creed. So there's no real official creed or statement of belief for Hinduism. Judaism as well doesn't really have an official statement of belief, but then that guy Maimonides kind of came up with some ideas that um, should be accepted for someone to be considered a right believing Jew. Christianity certainly has creeds and statements of belief, many, you know, many of them, some very official as we looked at. And Islam also is kind of like Judaism. It doesn't have like an official statement of belief, but over time, Islamic thinkers have come up with some central ideas that every right-believing Muslim should believe in. And this list of ideas is called Al-Aqidah or the Aqidah. And Aqidah, as you can see on the PowerPoint, means a statement of belief, a creed. So the creed, the creed of Islam. Really, the creed of Islam is the shahada, because you know the witness, the testimony, the witness that someone gives to the oneness of God and to the authority of Muhammad as his messenger. That's really, if, if I had to identify a creed, I would say it's that. But this is called a creed as well. It's a system of belief. These, these things are to be believed by, by all Muslims, ideally, I guess. And just so you know, when did this Al-Aqidah come about? It's attributed to this man, Abu Hanifa, who died in 676, excuse me, 767 AD. And in a book he wrote, and, and you can find this on the internet translated into English. At the in the opening of the book, which is called Al Fiqh Al Akbar, which I should have written down. I know what Fiqh is, but I forget what Akbar. Oh, oh Akbar. <laughs> Silly Mr. Dunn. Of course you know what Akbar means. Um, the how would you translate it? Well, fiqh is kind of like a word for Islamic law, like Islamic jurisprudence. Okay, if you're going to study to be a lawyer, you have to learn jurisprudence, which means that the way that the law works. Okay, so you will look at case studies, various court decisions. You'll talk about how do you how do you uh, write a writ? How do you present a writ to the courts to the court, which are documents asking for things from the court or asking them to enjoin things or stop people from doing things or make people do things. It, all sorts of paperwork that lawyers have, and this is lawyers have to learn how to do. And this is called jurisprudence. You know how you present a case in a courtroom. Okay, stuff like that. It's not all in the courtroom, but a lot of stuff that lawyers need to know about just how the law works. And that's what fiqh is in, um, in Arabic. So the, the great jurisprudence, one might say, or the great way of doing law. Although when I looked at the book, it's more theology than law. So I don't know if there's like maybe a double intended meaning going on here, like saying that the study of God is more than just the study of law, but whatever. In this book, al Fiq al-Akbar, this man Abu Hanifa starts out by talking about like what are the basic things we should understand as Muslims that, that are the ground rules for Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic belief. The basis of Tawheed, which means something else, but I'll talk about that later. Um, and what constitutes a valid belief is to say these things. I believe, obviously, number one has to be God. I believe in Allah, God, his existence, and his especially believing in his oneness, that he is absolutely one. I wrote that down. The second thing is the existence of angels, these spiritual beings. They are, they are created beings of spirit. They're not of flesh and blood as men are and women. Um, why, the, why the angels come second, I don't know, but they come second. The third thing is to believe in God's books, or you could also translate this as God's revelations. 
And we'll learn this later because uh, next week I'm going to talk about when I'm completing Islam, I'm going to talk about the different, you know, the different groups within Islam. But I also want to devote at least some time to talking about the relationship of Muhammad to Judaism and Christianity, whom he called the people of the book or the people of the scriptures. Uh, if you did the readings from the Quran, you might have noticed that there's a lot of mention of these people of the scriptures, talking about Jews and Christians. Um, and Muhammad did not, even though there's one Quran, remember, he's the seal of the prophets. Prophecy had been given before. Okay, so in Mah from Muhammad's point of view, revelations have been given before by God. Some of them had actually been written down as well. For example, amongst the Jews and the Christians. The Jews had the Tanakh, the Christians had the New Testament. So he didn't reject those things. As I'll tell you later, his problem with them was that he said that the Jews and the Christians changed them. They, they didn't write it down perfectly. They added their own ideas. So, but his message in the Quran was received perfectly. So the, the Muslims don't disbelieve those revelations because they also came from God. They don't reject the revelation to the Jews or to the Christians, but they don't follow them either, but they're not going to deny them. So when it says the revelations, it means, yes, many previous revelations, but certainly the revelation of the Quran. So the revelation of the Quran. God's messengers, yes, the messengers, which include Jesus, include Moses, from Judaism and Christianity, well, <laughs> Jesus also from Judaism, um, but obviously the, the, the emphasis here is on the final messenger, which is Muhammad, okay? Number five, resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. So Muhammad accepts the resurrection of the dead at the day, on the day of judgment. These two kind of go together. I guess you could separate them out, but it doesn't seem that they do. So the resurrection at the, on the day of judgment, which would be at the end of the world, when God comes to judge the world. Actually, Jesus, for Muslims, Jesus comes to judge the world. God sends Jesus to judge the world. So they accept that, that Jesus will come again, the prophet Jesus. So these statements of God will settle accounts, it's the day for settling accounts with God for all the good that you've done or the evil that you've done, the balance He's talking about this idea of scales that God will weigh out, maybe literally. Some Muslims like to leave, take this literally, but nevertheless, God will lay out your good deeds and your bad deeds on a scale. And if there are more bad deeds, then you're going to hell. If there are more good deeds, then you're going to paradise. And finally, what this translation translates as destiny. And this is this means predestining. God is complete god knows everything and god intends everything that happens so he destines everything to happen okay whether it's good or it's bad hmm interesting so even the bad things that might happen to me as a muslim were intended directly intended by god he knew he was going to do it but all from eternity and he did it too so there's no chance, there's no, there's no chance in that way, okay? There's no coincidence, nothing's a coincidence. And so if God intended me to, intends me to go to hell, then I'll go to hell. If he intends me to be saved, I'll be saved. So that belief in the complete um, uh, foreknowledge and power of God where he destines people and their lives and all things. All are true matters. So basically, Abu Hanifa is saying all of these are true and to be believed by, by a good Muslim. It's the Akidah. When we get to, say, we might say the concrete living of Islamic life, the concrete living of the beliefs, there are five things that characterize what a Muslim must do, okay, apart from belief. How are these beliefs acted on? Well, these five things are called pillars, like stone pillars, okay? Like the, uh, well, you might say if you're into construction or you watch the home renovation channels, you know? People always ask, they want to tear stuff down. Is this a load-bearing wall? Can I really tear this down? You know? Well, yeah, you can tear it down, but you're gonna have to put a big steel beam across it. It's gonna cost you some money. I'm just did. I'll put it on the credit card. So pillars, 
These are like the load-bearing walls of Islamic life. And there are five of them, the five pillars of faith. Well, that's interesting. Huh. Wonder why I put that. I'm just looking at my notes and talking to myself. Another name that you'll see for the five pillars of faith is, is the five pillars or the pillars of religion. The word deen. Remember at the beginning of the course, I talked about people had different words for religion and understandings of religion. And deen is the word that's used in Arabic. Um, I forget what it means literally. It's used to identify religion. Well, I don't want to say it because I don't, I don't remember. Anyways, but nevertheless, they're also called the five pillars of religion, of the religion, I should say, which is Islam. Hmm. The first of these pillars, again, as you might expect, is belief, which is shahada, the, the witness of belief in the one God and in his messenger, Muhammad. So Islam is founded upon this belief, this testimony. It is the, the shahada is the bedrock, the bedrock of the testimony of faith. Okay, it's the basis for everything else that, that comes after in Islam, the, this, the shahada, which I've shown you already. The shahada, or the, the first pillar, is more than just a statement of monotheism. Yes, it is a statement of monotheism, that there is one God, he alone. Um, but it's more than just that. It implies belief that Allah is oneness itself. This word tawheed, which we saw before, and now I'm explaining it to you. This word tawheed is used to describe the absolute complete unity that is God. He is oneness. He is unity. He is Tawheed. So God is indivisible. He can't be divided or cut up into other things. But it also means, and by being cut up into other things, one might say like a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> or in Hinduism, the Trimurti. Okay, but Muhammad has in mind here more Christianity, it's Trinity. So God is indivisible, but it also extends to the fact that God is indefinable. He's indescribable, really, because he's so completely one and other and singular um, than, than this world that we live in, this created world. So he's indefinable. He's been, of course, he's also incomparable. He can't be compared really to anything. He is entirely Tawheed. He is entirely unique. So to talk about things like I talked about with Christianity, Christianity talks about the nature, the divine nature, yes, and taught and makes this kind of distinction between God's nature and his personhood, which of course is one and the same. God is both one in nature, but he's also personal but Christianity kind of its special sauce is to recognize that the personal aspect of God is, is multiple, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, for Judaism as well, God is a personal God. And I guess you could say for Islam, he is personal in the sense that he relates to us, but to talk about essence or nature, or to talk about the attributes of God is, for Islam is really meaningless. OK, it's because he's always beyond anything we can describe him as for a, if you're a Muslim. So when Muslims cry out, oh, you know, the, the common uh, phrase that people associate with Islam is the statement, Allahu Akbar, which is a very frequent statement that you will hear, very frequent statement in Muslim prayer, Islamic prayer. We see Allah here, so we already know that means the God, and we see the word Akbar already, which means great. So God is translated as God, but we know it means the God. Again, the God, one, the unity, the singular. God is great. This is how it's often translated into English, but that's not really how li what literally it is. It's God is greater, it's a comparative. Like an absolute, it's not comparing anything to anything else. It's like an absolute comparison. God is greater than anything else. 
It's not saying like, well, God is greater than other gods. No, it's saying God is greater than anything, period. So that's what Allahu Akbar, when, when Muslim, Muslims will say it, it's, a, it's an act of devotion. It's acknowledging this Tawheed, that God is utterly transcendent. And here we get back to the beginning of the course when I talked about what religion is. And one of the aspects I identified of religion is this idea of transcendence, this something, some ultimate reality overarches and defines the whole world for the person. It gives the universe complete meaning. For a Muslim, this would be God who is one. So I give you a little quote there from the Quran, Surah 112, in the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Say this, saying, telling Muhammad to say this, God is one, the eternal God. He begot none, nor was he begotten. None is equal to him. He begot none. He, in other words, he doesn't have any children. He doesn't beget children. Take that, Christians, <laughs> who think that Jesus is God's son. And he doesn't come from anything. He is his own source of existence. And put this on the power. Okay. Sin against Tawheed is called shirk or sharing, which means sharing anything that sharing God's glory, you could say, or the prerogatives that belong to God with any created thing, any creature anything that is less than God, which should never happen. So there you have your definition, any creaturely thing, even Muhammad himself. And so just as a side, you had a little side uh, comment you have had in the history of Islam. And this is one of, this is actually the prevailing um, sect of Islam that, uh, that is in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, but, you know, you have groups in Islam that interpret any sort of devotion, even to the prophet and his companions as shirk. And so in the history of Islam, um, you've had you had groups that would go would, went around and destroyed the grave sites of, you know, holy Muslim leaders, Muhammad and stuff like that. I mean, I showed you Muhammad's tomb, but um, and especially I mean, like Shiite Muslims are in their view, the worst, because Shia and Shia, they have a very long, very strong tradition of honoring holy, holy spiritual leaders, and they build their, their they make pilgrimages to their tombs and whatnot. So you have these issues where you have, for example, like the Taliban or Al Qaeda going around attacking Shiite shrines, um, blowing them up or destroying them because they consider it shirk. You're giving too much honor to these men, as holy as they were. Um, whereas only God should receive such devotion. So shirk, it is the unforgivable sin. And it doesn't just include idol worship. Because, and, and Muhammad has a lot to say about idol worship in the Quran. And he's, he's, he's very clear, and it's in the readings that I gave you. He says that those who worship idols will go to hell, period. There's absolutely no, there's no gray area. You worship idols, you go to hell. And in the Islamic empire, you worshiped idols, you were killed. There was, you know, Christians and Jews would be left alone for the most part. I mean, they might have some, have to do some things, pay a tax or something to the, uh, the, the, the uh, Muslim ruler, but people who would not be allowed to, to worship idols. That was, that was a no-go, a no that was a, a non-starter for Islam. That's considered shirk, sure, definitely. But anything that obscures the oneness of God. So, for example, the teaching on the Trinity of Christianity is considered shirk. It's considered making Jesus a God, like God. And so that could be considered shirk as a form of sharing. But also things like ascribing human attributes to God, like saying God has hands or feet or something, or God is like a human in certain ways. And, you know, just like talking about God, maybe we might look at that as maybe an irreverent kind of way of talking about God or not accurate. We might recognize that that's not accurate. Well, um, but with Islam, that's certainly not accurate <laughs> and could be considered as shirk and, and get you into trouble religiously. So anything that impinges on God's sovereignty. So here we have a statement from Quran 
chapter 5, Sura 5, which I believe was from our reading, where you, uh, and I mentioned this before, so I'm, I don't have to really go through it again, but I'll just point out, Allah, you know, he says, those who disbelieve say that, the, you know, Allah is the Messiah, the son of Mary, and he's referring to Jesus. He's saying that, they say that Christ, the son of Mary, is God. This is kind of an interesting statement because it, it shows, and you, sh you should know this now, I'm sure, that Muhammad confused Christ for, for Jesus' actual name, yeah? Remember, Christ is not Jesus' name. So it shows a, kind of maybe a lack of understanding of Christianity. He hears Christ and he thinks that's his name, but it's not. So he doesn't call him Jesus. He calls him Christ, Messiah. But then he, qu he quotes from Jesus. Now, this quote is nowhere from Jesus. It's not in the Gospels. It's in none of the extra literature about Jesus that didn't make it into the New Testament. This is purely, from my perspective, Muhammad's creation. But if you're a Muslim, you believe that this is true. So I, I respect that, but I think it's his own creation. Oh, children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever ascribes partners unto Allah, for him Allah has forbidden paradise. Your abode is fire. Surely those who disbelieve say, behold, Allah is the third of three. The first person of the Blessed Trinity, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the third. You know. When there is no God save one God, if they don't stop saying this, a painful doom will fall on them. Now, this is in the Quran, so this is high up. I mean, this is, this is again, this is from the Umm al-Kitab. So, I mean, I don't know how you have interreligious relations if this ever comes up and, like, Christians ever ask maybe Muslims that they're they're relating to, like, do you really think that we're forbidden paradise for believing that, you know, Jesus is one of three or God is the third of three or, or that we're ascribing a partner to, to God by saying that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are also divine? I don't know. Might be an interesting question to ask. Prayer. Salah. Prayer is, well, what can you say about prayer? It's major. I mean, it's every day. It's, it's once you become a Muslim, you're required every day to pray um, multiple times a day. Um, prayer for Islam is, is, you know, individual. You have individual, you, you're supposed to, you are supposed to pray. So whether, you know, you have a bunch of other fellow Muslims around or not, you have to pray. So it's certainly individual but also has its communal aspects where Muslims come together as a community, as a group to pray. It is mentioned in the Quran as a duty. So it's an obligation very clearly um, from God. Uh, and it's linked, prayer is, is linked in the Quran with almsgiving, giving, with charity, you know, with, with what you might say, social justice, doing just things to people, good things to people. So. It's not just, you know, a, a mechanical, okay, I've said my prayers, I'm a good Muslim, okay? That's part of it, definitely, but it's united to also good practices. And there are various times during the day when you must pray. What do those times, Dr. Dunn? Well, these are the following fixed hours, five times. At dawn, at noontime, in the afternoon, at sunset, and then when it gets dark at night. And there are, you know, there are, there are ways to know, the, because you, you have to know the exact times when it starts. <laughs> you know, you can't, it's one of these things you don't usually make your own decisions as a Muslim, like, uh, it seems like the sun is set, or I think the sun has risen, or yeah, noontime could be 12-ish, no. <laughs> There are oftentimes very specific times where you are in the world when you're supposed to pray. And if you're confused or not sure, then you can call your local mosque. Um, and I went to a mosque in Papua New Guinea. I'm not going to show the video, but you can see it online on my YouTube channel. And they had, you know, they had digital things up there with the time and all sorts of information. You know, the, the coordinates of Mecca. So you knew where to pray and the time of day it was when you knew when to pray, not just where. So there are fixed hours. 
And it's the duty of all Muslims, male and female, to observe prayer at these hours. Um, what do I say about that? Oh, yes, before. Salah means prayer. This word is called salah. You'll also hear it called salat, salat. Um, but that's part of the term. I mean, it, it's the possessive of salat, salah. So salat means prayer of, the prayer of morning, the prayer of noon, the prayer of sunset. And so it's just shortened. And there, there are Arabic words for those times of day, which I don't know. I mean, I could have looked them up, but I'm not going to worry about it. But uh, so just you might also come across it just simply being called salat. Okay, so if you see it called Salah or Salat, both are correct. Before you perform prayer, you have to wash yourself, you know, wash your hands, wash your feet, wash your head. You can't, you have to be ritually clean. Uh, you can do it. I said, I don't know. What do I want to say here? Yeah. You can do it anywhere, but if you do it, at a, but you still have to clean yourself. Um, but a lot of times people associate mosques as the place where people will go to pray. And that's really what mosques are for. It's the place where you commute, you pray as a group. But if you're near a mosque, then I presume you could just walk down the street and go to the mosque and pray. It will be open for you to pray. But if you can't, you know, you find a, a room or some place to, to do your prayers, as long as you wash yourself and you're praying towards Mecca. Do I say that in my notes or... That's a, eh, okay. Well, I have that in the definition. You will need a prayer mat. So it's kind of like yoga mat in a way, but you have a, a mat that you are to pray on. And you must, you can't just pray in any direction. You have to pray towards the Kaaba in Mecca, that, that black cube structure that is in the main mosque of Mecca, the sacred mosque of Mecca. You're actually, people will say, well, they're praying towards Mecca, the city. Well, not really the city. You have to pray directly towards the Kaaba. That is the Qibla, the Qibla, the direction of the Kaaba, okay, which is in the mosque, which is in Mecca, yes. So it's kind of like Vatican II, which I told you took place in Vatican City, which is in Rome. So you could say Vatican II took place in Rome. Not completely accurate, whatever. So if someone says that, yes, in, in Islam, we pray towards Mecca, that's accurate, but not completely accurate. You're actually playing, the Qibla is uh, the direction towards the Kaaba, to which you are supposed to pray. And in every mosque, every mosque, they will have, because they should have, what's called a mikrab, which is something, some kind of a, a niche of some kind in one of the walls which indicates the direction, the correct direction of the Kaaba, the mihrab. And here's a picture of a mihrab in a mosque in, I believe, Finland. And there you have the imam, um, one of the leaders of the community standing in front of it. And so that's, so you know, that's absolutely the direction I have to pray. And I guess if you want to be even more absolutely sure that you're following the law and and praying in that direction, they've got a, like a mat, a prayer mat right up against it. So there's just no, you know, you're, you're not, there's no confusion because you have to do it. The person who, well, I mean, uh, ideally, uh, Salah should be prayed in common in a mosque. But as I said, if you can't do that, then you definitely have to do it individually. You should, you have to do it individually. Um, but usually, typically, for Muslims, they will make an effort to come together on Fridays at noontime. There will be a, a noon prayer service, uh, just a special prayer service. I mean, it's not unusual because you still have to pray during the rest of the time during the day. But Muslims will make time at noontime to go to a mosque to be with the community for this service on Fridays. What happens at a mosque? Well, at a signal from the prayer leader, who's called an imam, an imam, who can be anybody. There's no priesthood or rabbi, or, you know, and, and well, actually, that's kind of like what a, a rabbi does in a synagogue, okay? He kind, he kind of leads things, but he's, he's not like, um, he's not like a priest or anything like that. He doesn't necessarily have to lead the service. He might lead the service, um, but certainly an imam can be any 
Muslim man who's there, um, who just is leading the community in the prayer. Okay, he doesn't necessarily have any special authority in the community. Although I understand from things that I've read that this is kind of changing because Americans don't really understand that. We think in terms of Christianity. So we think in terms of priests and ministers, you know, uh, and to some extent rabbis who are religious leaders in their community and do think it's not really the role of an imam. He just, he leads the prayers. That's it. You know, he doesn't necessarily have any special knowledge about Islam. He's not necessarily a scholar or doesn't have any degree or have gone to a seminary. It's just very practical. He leads the people in the prayer. But that seems to be changing in places like America. So you have people who now imams receive training, apparently, more formal training. So men and women will assemble separately. They, men and women will certainly not be together in a mosque. The men will be all up front. Women will either be in the back with children, children, or they will be in a special room on the side, which oftentimes has a curtain or some kind of wall. So you can't even really see the women um, if you're there. You can hear them though. And you sit down in rows and following the lead of the Imam, people will bow their bodies in a series of ritual movements. And there oftentimes people will recite words of prayer from the Quran. And from their standing position, there will be bows. And this is all very formalized and stylized. I'm not going to um, get into it because it, you know, there's a whole, it's a whole thing. Or maybe I can get into it. Yes, I think I will. Um, I do want to talk about the pilgrimage. Yeah, I think I will because I do have a video, but and I wasn't sure if I would have time, but I'll make the time. It's not very long; it's seven minutes, so I pay attention to it. This guy's teaching. I guess this guy's Korean. I guess he's a new convert. He's teaching him. So clean your body. And after finishing that, our dress also will change. Dress. Yes, many times on the dress we must be complete. Hey, dude, that's that. oh, that's okay. Okay. The place for namaz, close for salat. Uh, salat. Salat. The place we will take anywhere you can do prayer. Uh, not even in mosque. Not only in can... mosque, yeah. But place must be clean. Clean. <laughs> so three clean body, dress, and the place yes. of the salat. Then we have to move. I will add one thing that he doesn't mention. Yes, he mentions your body and your clothes and the place, but also your mind. And so one of the aspects of Salat before you even get to prayer is that you are supposed to quietly kind of center your mind and clean your and purify your intention to focus your mind on, you know, I am about to pray to God. Some of you went to the, it might see a connection. Remember, some of you went to the Zen uh, meditation, yes? And the lady, you know, talked about, give you a little intro and remember she talked, you know, there are things you need to do to prepare yourself just to begin the meditation. You want to focus your mind on, okay, not just getting in and doing it, but preparing yourself to do it. Same thing in this religion. You have to cleanse your intention, have a clean intention. Uh, 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 we have to say Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Always right hand is up. To ring and yes. there is many kind. Some mm. brothers like this. Some here. Some middle. Some you know. Mm. So all are correct. Yeah. Okay. So saying the takbir Allahu Akbar. And, start and that tells you that what kind of Muslims they are, how they hold their hands, because Sunni Muslims, the group who are the great majority of Muslims will hold their hands like this, like kind of crossed or just, you know, clasped. But Shiites who are the minority group, they don't do that apparently. They just stand with their hands there at their sides. So you can actually kind of tell if you went into a mosque by how they're praying, which kind of mosque it is or who the major majority of the believers are, what they follow. 
studying salat, studying prayer, by takbir at tahrimah, by takbir Allahu Akbar, this is the reason. Uh, that's important. And say Allahu Akbar. Study your salat by Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This is humble, it will be. Ah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Even Imam saying Allahu Akbar, and we are praying with Imam. We also have that to saying, mm. not too loudly. Yes. Okay. Okay, then we will recite something mm. like Sana, Sana, Subhanaka, Bahama, Wati Hamlika, Wata Smoka, Wata Alajatika, Wata So a rocket would be like the first practice <laughs> or a different so practice or a section, I would say, the first section of the prayer. We will recite Audu Billahi in a Shaykh or Nikoji, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. And Mezer Surah is Surah Al Fatiha, the first of the Quran. And Alhamdulillah, the Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahman, the Rahim, Madiki, the Omidin, Iya, the Rabbil Alameen, Ihina Surah Al Mustafim, Surah Al Ladin. Okay, so unless you didn't catch that, the Surah Tul Fatiha, yes, Surah number one, which is the, the shortest Surah, it's a, a short Surah at the beginning of the Quran, a little introductory Surah. So it's part of Islamic prayer during the five times of the day. That's why, in case you didn't hear what I said, a rakah, it's kind of like a section. You know, you just don't pray once, okay? There are like four, three or four, well, I don't want to say an exact number because I might get it wrong, but there are multiple sections that are repetitive. You're basically doing the same thing, but you don't just do it once. So there are multiple times that you're going to do these things and pretty much saying the same thing. It usually includes some prayer, Maybe a, a little quotation from the Quran, some further prayer. So, so reciting anything from Quran mm -hmm. is also measured inside of the salah, measured thing of the inside. And doing qiyam, qiyam, qiyam means standing up. Yeah. Okay, this yes. is also more important. Then, after finishing uh, Surah Al Fatiha, we will decide something from Quran. Any mm -hmm. yeah. I should say Al Fatiha first and then mm -hmm. other Quran verse. But, uh, any verses of the Quran, uh -huh. or any smallest surah, the ayat is verse is long, then what is enough? If the ayat is smallest, then three ayat. After finishing this, we will go to Rukur. Rukur. Rukur called by saying Allahu Akbar, we will go to town like this. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And in the world, what we do, we say, Subhana Rabbi Al-Azim. 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 Azim. Azim. So like, put your hand, put on the hand on me. Me. And make this step for this step. Pull yourself. Little bit put your back, holy and body will be checked. Oh. Now you are not. That's <laughs> 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 okay. have to be straight, I guess. Okay, go back. God likes a straight back, baby. Sami Allahu Liman Hamida. Sami Allahu Liman Hamida. Okay, we are waiting a little bit. Mm -hmm. After waiting a little bit, we will go to the town. Mm -hmm. It's called Sijda. Sijda. Yeah. So how to Sijda? By saying that the Allah, 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 Then we will go back to the our uh, start position, okay? By saying Allah, 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 Allah,
So I guess if you don't do it in the right order or the right way, then your salat is wrong and basically you have to do it all over again. You also have to do it like if you fart. <laughs> If you do anything that impurifies yourself, like you pass gas or you have to go to the bathroom quickly, you have to cleanse yourself again and start all over from the beginning. Okay, so you look to the right and to the left, and you're basically saying peace to the person next to you. But if you're alone, the angels are with you. So you're saying that to the angels who are with you praying as well. So you're never really alone. You still have to do it, even if no one's there, because someone is there. The angels are with you. Because angels, yeah. angels, yeah. It's angels, but I think for calculate, and this is for the yeah. You have to do salam, both of the angels. Uh -huh. And not only angels, the people also joining with you. You also do salam. Uh -huh. You have to pray, sing, move. Many people have. Uh -huh. because you will do salam for all, uh -huh. also right side and left side. Uh -huh. And just uh, other people. Other people. Uh -huh. okay. Our salam is finished. Okay? Yes. You will need to say, ah, don't worry. You will need to say, well, that's only that's only one raka that he showed him. Okay, so because they have to do there are two, three, sometimes four more. So it's not that long, maybe twenty to thirty minutes, I would say. But the th other other thing about the angels, when he's talking about the angels on your sh on his on his shoulders, um, you know, the belief is that God has given every person two angels. There's the angel on your right shoulder, who record is recording all your good deeds throughout your life. The angel on your left shoulder records all your bad deeds throughout your life. And then when you die, each one puts them on the scale to see which is which is heavier. So prayer. The next one is almsgiving. You could also call this charity or benevolence or altruism, but you know, giving money to the poor, certainly, helping out the needy. The hungry, those who don't have clothing or shelter, those who are in debt or people who are prisoners, travelers, people who are traveling, migrants, refugees, all these sorts of things. It's called zakat in Arabic, which has the literal meaning of purification. And that's how it's kind of seen that you are purifying the wealth that God has given you. And by wealth, I don't mean like you're wealthy, like a billionaire or something, but that the things, the stuff that you have, which have come to you through God's providence, his destining of you, and you are giving that back to others. You're showing, you're showing um, um, care for others. And so that kind of purifies the wealth that you have for, uh, that you have for your personal use, but now you're kind of like giving it over to God, to God's use. So, I mean, what does this mean? A lot of people simply interpret zakat as giving money and uh, contemporary practice um, determines that around 2% of a Muslim's income should be given to almsgiving to fulfill zakat because it's a requirement of Muslim law. And it should, it's, uh, you know, within reason, of course, so the zakat is payable according to a person's means. So if a person is very poor, then obviously 2% means a lot more to them than to say, you know, uh, Elon Musk, <laughs> who's now the richest man in the world, or what's his name? I forget his first name, Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, you know, who are built multi-billionaires. 2%, you know, that, that wouldn't keep them up at night, you know, at all. Um, they'd make that up in interest on their money within a, probably an hour or so. But for a poor person, yeah, so you have to also consider your means. But 2% is the, the typical um, established amount from a person's income, annual income. Poor kid. And just to show you where it's mentioned in the Quran, yes, he mentions pay the poor due, give alms, and whatever good you send before your souls, you will find it with Allah, which is just a nice, beautiful way of saying that God will reward you for giving charity to others. 
fasting or psalm, psalm. And psalm is Arabic for fasting, so there's no need to even translate it. That's exactly what it means. And in the Quran, in Surah 2, God says, fasting is prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those who came before you. Why? And there's a, you know, it tells you why. So that you may learn self-restraint. You may learn to control yourself, control your appetites, not just your, you know, appetite for food, but physical appetites, like the appetite for sex um, or for pleasures in the world. Not that pleasure, not saying pleasure is bad at all. Um, in fact, paradise, the, the Islamic heaven is very pleasurable. It's filled with all sorts of, of physical pleasures with food and maybe even sexual pleasures and stuff like that, but certainly food and beautiful things and cool breezes and water and wine. Well, I don't know there'd be wine in heaven. I shouldn't say that, sorry about that. Um, but so fat, but fasting gives self-restraint to a person, control, self-control. Fasting is most often can, uh, identified, I mean, I guess a Muslim could fast any time throughout the year, but certainly during the, the month of Ramadan in the Islamic calendar, which is going on right now, it is the, um, oh, did I write it down? I looked it up. Eh, I'm just trying to remember if it's the, uh, it's not the first, it's the, is it the last month? No, that's the Hajj. The ninth month, I believe. I think it's the ninth month in the uh, Islamic calendar. I didn't write it down. Oh, well. Um, but anyways, the month of Ramadan is, is specifically prescribed in the Quran as the month of fasting. So during Ramadan, there is total abstinence during the day from food and drink, from other pleasurable things like maybe smoking, <laughs> which I guess is not very pleasurable anymore, but in the past, I guess people like to do it. Um, sexual activities, things like that. Okay, those are to be avoided during the daylight hours of Ramadan. And if you miss it, if you decide not to do it, then some kind of compensation must be made up for the days missed. And from what I understand, it's either going to be in this life or in the next life. You know, God might require it of you in the next life if, if you go to heaven, but you missed some months of Ramadan through your life. God will say, okay, well, you're going to spend the next few years or whatever observing Ramadan to make up for all those Ramadans that you missed. Um, the fundamental idea of fasting is to give thanks to God, to thank him for all the things that he gives and to discipline the person's soul so that the person is relying on God, waiting patiently on the God who guides him or her and provides what he or she needs. According to Muhammad, fasting is of all the duties that are required of a Muslim, the duties of worship, Muhammad identified fasting as the most beloved of God. Um, why? Because it is the only thing that God himself sees, because you can't necessarily tell if a person is fasting or abstaining or not, unless they tell you or do something like make themselves go on or something. So, hey, are you fasting? Oh, yes, I'm glad you noticed, you know, but it's something that really only God can see. I mean, God can see you get, you know, other people can see you give money to a poor person or whatever, help an old lady across the street. But fasting is internal. So according to Muhammad, that is, that is the highest form of worship that you can give. Who has to fast during Ramadan? Well, adult males who have a sound mind and good health. So if you're sick or elderly, then you are, you are, you're not required. You are, you are, um, you are removed from the requirement. You are accepted from the requirement. As I said, it only occurs during the daylight hours and, and sometimes, well, you don't have to do this, but it seems to be a common practice amongst Muslims that when nighttime comes during Ramadan, there will be some sort of small celebration. People are not supposed to gorge yourself, stuff yourself with food, but people might take a little food and drink at the end of after the day is over, but certainly during daylight hours, nothing. And as I said, if you miss it, then you have to make compensation for it. You know, you have to do it because God requires it and God's not going to like let you get away with it. It will be quite, it will even be required of you in the afterlife. The same thing goes with prayer. Let's say if you decide, and I'm not going to say my prayers today, 
as a Muslim. Okay, but you're going to be doing them in the afterlife if you make it there. God will still require them of you, all those prayers. And, you know, I, I think I, I might have heard this from some of my Muslim students or whatever. I, um, well, I don't want to, I, I think I heard this, that, you know, there are people who will, well, I won't say it, it doesn't matter. Because um, I, I think I heard it from one of my Muslim students in the past, but I don't think I verified it, so I'll leave it alone. The last of the pillars is pilgrimage, the hajj, hajj, which basically means a pilgrimage, but the word hajj in Arabic, remember Arabic and Hebrew are related languages, they're from the same language family, and Hebrew has a very similar word, hajj, which means a celebration, a festival, a holiday, but the root meaning of this word hajj in Hebrew, Hebrew comes from a root, the root, the root consonant meaning, has the sense of going around something as in a circle, to circumambulate, as they say, okay, which is a religious practice. And here you go. Here are people, this says it's live. I don't, I'm assuming it's live today, but who knows? Nevertheless, but this is, you know, people, there is the month of pilgrimage. The last month of the Islamic year is the month when you're supposed to go on the major pilgrimage and fulfill your duty. But people can go through Mecca to Mecca all throughout the year. They might make minor pilgrimages. And one of the things you're supposed to do is to walk around the Kaaba. And so here you have thousands, maybe could be, well, thousands upon thousands, I would say, um, going around the Kaaba, saying their prayers together. Um, if you get close enough, you touch it, but it looks like they're not allowing people to get close. Um, but you're certainly supposed to touch that black stone. If you go on the main pilgrimage, I believe you have to touch the black stone that is embedded in one of the corners of the Kaaba. But here you see it happening, Hag, this idea of going around, fulfilling your obligation, maybe not now, but at the end of the end of the Muslim year. And this also is mentioned in the Quran. In Quran chapter three or Surah three, Muhammad receives the revelation, the first sanctuary appointed for mankind. Actually, you know what? I want to say more about this. So I'll save it for next week um, on Tuesday, because this is there's a number of things to say here. So I'll see you. Have a good weekend. God bless you all. I'll see you on Tuesday. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. On the verification form. Yeah. Do I just have to call them and say, can I get an email confirmation just saying I'm yeah, there? Yeah, just, just get an email from them. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, get it as soon as possible. What I forget what I, what did I say in the email? that Tonight, midnight. Yeah, so try and get it as soon as I mean, you've spoken to me. You haven't been able to get anything, yes? Yeah, no, not yet. I, well, I didn't even call you. I saw it last night, and then I just like... As soon as possible, yeah, please, sir. If, if you're having difficulties, let me know. Of course. And I can, I can maybe extend it for another day. All right. But, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to call them right now. Okay. Yeah, just an email is fine. You download it as a PDF. Yeah. Upload it. All you're right. fine. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome, sir. I'll go again for my verification form. Yeah. I was um, talking to a rabbi down at the Temple of Israel, and he emailed you, and you told me that he emailed you, and I tried to, I don't know how to download the emails, so I just copied and pasted the emails to my document, and that got deleted, so I don't know what to do about it. Where, where did you put the email? The email was at the bottom of the course project, like the right. Okay, because I, I think I scrolled through it to the end. Um, was it like a picture or something, or did you just copy them? I, I don't really know how I did it. Like, it looked like it was format like the email. So. Okay. Um, yeah, that's pro if, if it was just, yeah, because um, if it was like a, a picture or something, because I didn't, I don't, some people did that and I noticed the image. They inserted the image into the document. Okay, fine. But um, it seems like, well, it doesn't matter. Um, I gave instructions in my, in my uh, announcement, right, that uh, Show you how, how you can go into Outlook 
and download it as a PDF file. So do that, follow the instructions, and then just upload it with your thing. So you there in the announcement, sir. I'm Blackboard. I'm Blackboard. Right, Mr. Slacktish, you still there? No, okay. I don't know what to tell you. Thank you. 